Hey guys, today I want to talk about acute pancreatitis and a basic management and approach to it. This is a video that was requested by Tom Chen on Twitter, so thanks for requesting this video. And basically, this is just going to be my simple approach that I often use for teaching uh, interns or medical students pancreatitis. So in terms of pancreatitis, the first thing that we want to talk about is how to make the diagnosis. And this is based off of three criteria. So number one is going to be typical symptoms of pancreatitis. So that's going to be basically acute epigastric pain that's radiating to the back. Keep in mind that over 90% of patients will have associated nausea and vomiting. And also sometimes they'll give a history of the pain being relieved somewhat by sitting up or with leaning forward. The second diagnostic criteria is gonna be uh, radiographic findings of pancreatitis, whether that be a CT or ultrasound. Usually it's gonna be a CT scan. And then three is going to be amylase or lipase greater than three times the upper limit of normal. Okay, and in order to make the diagnosis of pancreatitis, you're going to need, need at least two of the three criteria to formally make the diagnosis. The next thing to talk about uh, is really the etiology of uh, the pancreatitis. And almost always, the, there's gonna be two main etiologies, and that's gonna be gallstone pancreatitis, and then number two is gonna be alcohol, which is uh, also very common, but slightly uh, lower incidence compared to gallstone pancreatitis. Pancreatitis. And then I always like to go over the um, I get smashed mnemonic that you may remember from first aid. And, you know, to be honest, I don't really find it a very useful mnemonic because I don't remember all the things that are in it. I have to always look it up. But the fact that you know about this mnemonic will help you in terms of figuring out more obscure etiologies. So you can just look up uh, this mnemonic. So basically, I is idiopathic, G is for gallstones, and E is for ethanol. Um, you can see these are basically the two most common causes in the US. Uh, it says that gallstones are the second most common cause. I was reading on up to date that gallstones were actually the most common cause. Either way, they're the top two causes. Then you can get trauma, steroids, mumps or malignancy, autoimmune pancreatitis, scorpion sting. And this is one to definitely note because this is going to be a very obscure fact that uh, in medical school or in residency, you're really going to get pimped on uh, randomly all the time. People just really like to talk about the scorpion stings causing panc pancreatitis. And then hypertriglyceridemia. This is really going to be triglycerides over a thousand or calcium over 15. So it has to be very, very elevated. I have seen this, however. So it's not something that, you know, never happens. This definitely does happen. And so it's always important to check a lipid panel on your patients. Post ERCP pancreatitis is definitely a common complication that occur, can occur. And then drugs can also cause uh, this. So always remember, if you're looking for more obscure signs uh, or causes of pancreatitis, remember this, I get smashed mnemonic, and you can just basically Google it and kind of get a good idea of things to look into. All right. And the next really want to talk about treatment. And there's basically two pillars of treatment here. And that's going to be very, very aggressive fluid resuscitation and then very adequate pain control. So these are definitely the two pillars of treating uh, pancreatitis. And one of the biggest things that happens is that patients are not adequately fluid resuscitated. Uh, and so that leads to them not recovering as well or as quickly from their pancreatitis than they should have. And if you go on up to date, you'll see that the amounts of fluids that they're giving these people is actually really huge. Your hospital probably has a protocol. Um, um, I looked at the protocol for my hospital and it's one liter of LR in the first hour and then 250 cc's an hour of LR for 12 hours and then 150 cc's an hour um, I think kind of maintenance fluids thereafter. And that's just kind of like a basic starting range. Sometimes you even need to give more fluids depending on how sick they are. And the reason that these patients are so volume down is because the pancreatic enzymes basically leak out. So say you have a pancreas right here and it's all inflamed. It's leaking out all these enzymes everywhere. And these digestive enzymes are super, super irritating. And so once they get to the blood vessels, they actually cause this very significant capillary leak. And so this capillary leak causes all this extravasation of fluid and all these things. So all their fluid starts to third space. And so that's how you end up getting very, very severe hypovolemia. This is the primary mechanism for most of the organ dysfunction that you're going to see in pancreatitis as well. And then going back to pain control, it's very important to get these patients on a very good uh, pain regimen. Usually it's going to be involving opioids because it is a severely painful condition. So opioids, sometimes you'll need to put them on a PCA pump or patient controlled analgesia because that will really help optimize, you know, the patient being able to choose when they need more pain control. Uh, and one thing to note is that there was is one opioid that is thought to maybe have slightly better effects in pancreatitis, and that's going to be meparidine. 
And so this is an opioid that is thought to cause less sphincter of odi uh, spasms. And so that would theoretically help in pancreatitis. In truth, the evidence for this does not seem that strong, but it is something you may get asked about. Like, what is the best opioid for uh, pancreatitis? Sometimes people will be trying to look for the answer of you saying meperidine in that case. A couple other very common pimp questions that you may get asked is, what should we do in regards to their diet? Okay. A lot of the time, um, you know, the prevailing historical way to treat this was to put them on NPO uh, for strict bowel rest. And now the evidence has shown that doing this practice actually does not really help at all. And it actually kind of prolongs uh, recovery and makes them in pain a little bit longer. And so basically, you really should start them on a diet as soon as possible and advance it as tolerated. You're going to want to start with a low fat, low residue diet. You know, if they're you know, having a lot of severe epigastric pain, you can start with clear liquids and then advance to a low fat diet and then basically get them back to solid foods as quickly as possible. And then another very common question is antibiotic prophylaxis is that indicated this is another old practice that used to happen you know a lot of people were worried that patients with pancreatitis had so much inflammation that they're going to be prone to developing infections so they would just start people on antibiotics but recent evidence has shown that antibiotic prophylaxis is not beneficial so do not just start prophylactic antibiotics unless there is a clear infection that you're going to be trying to treat again these are going to be very common pimp questions that you're going to get on the wards all right then moving forward uh, i wanted to discuss some scoring systems for predicting mortality. And the question is, how can we predict what patients are going to do worse with their pancreatitis and which ones are going to have a favorable prognosis? And the two scoring systems that really you should know about are the BISAP scoring system and Ranson's criteria, which is a little bit of an older one. And basically, I would just go on to MDCalc and look this up. But BISAP stands for BUN, impaired mental status, SIRS, age, and plural effusion. So one of the things I want to point out here with the BISAP score is that one of the criteria that it talks about is the BUN. And a lot of times when these patients are coming, gonna come in, they're gonna have very, very high hemoglobin levels, like 18 or 19. They're gonna have very high BUN, and they're gonna have low calcium. And so it's kind of um, a question that you may get asked as well is why do they come in with such high BUN, hemoglobin, and low calcium? And so both of these are really because of their severe volume depletion, because basically everything is just gonna become hemoconcentrated, and that's why you see such concentration, and that's why it's also associated with a worse outcome, because the more volume depleted you come in and the higher your BUN is, the worse you're often gonna do in terms of your outcome. One of the PIM questions I got as a medical student is why do patients often come in with low calcium levels. And that's really going to be saponification by pancreatic enzymes. So basically, the pancreatic enzymes go around and they bind all the calcium and form uh, basically soap <laughs> in your body. And so this depletes your body's levels of calcium and you can get very severe hypocalcemia. All right. And then finally, the last thing to discuss is complications of acute pancreatitis. Basically, the big categories you're going to be talking about are kind of fluid collections that develop around the pancreas. So there are some that really just show up with what's called interstitial pancreatitis. This is kind of just your run-of-the-mill pancreatitis. And then um, you have necrotizing pancreatitis, which is basically a much more severe version of pancreatitis. And then you also have complications that develop less than four weeks in and greater than four weeks in. So with interstitial pancreatitis complication that's less than four weeks in, that's going to be an acute peripancreatic fluid collection. And for necrotizing pancreatitis in less than four weeks, you can have acute necrotic collection. For interstitial pancreatitis that's greater than four weeks, you may develop a pancreatic pseudocyst. And then for necrotizing pancreatitis, you can develop walled off necrosis. And so what really differentiates uh, these you know, more chronic ones is that they're associated with a very defined wall, whereas the ones above do not have a defined wall. And then just as a side note, some other complications that you can develop. So you can develop ARDS. Uh, pancreatitis is one of the causes of acute respiratory distress syndrome. You can def uh, develop chronic pancreatitis. And uh, this often can cause kind of pancreatic insufficiency, uh, malabsorption problems. One of the things to note with chronic pancreatitis is that your lipase levels may be normal even if they're coming in with basically everything sounding like acute pancreatitis, acute on chronic pancreatitis, uh, their pancreas is basically burnt out, so lipase levels may be normal. And then finally, you can get a splenic vein thrombosis. 
Uh, this is because the splenic vein basically runs right behind the pancreas. And so if you have a lot of pancreatic inflammation, then you're going to start developing a higher risk for developing a clot there. Uh, in terms of anticoagulation, usually uh, you don't anticoagulate unless it's extending and causing liver involvement or going into the portal or hepatic veins. Basically, the treatment is to treat the underlying cause. All right, again, here's a picture of kind of the table that we drew earlier and basically showing that, you know, with these acute collections, you don't really see a defined wall. But with these more chronic ones like pancreatic pseudocyst, walled off necrosis, that's when you see a very well-defined wall. And usually this is going to develop greater than four weeks after the initial incident of pancreatitis. And the management for this, basically to go over it really quickly, so if they're asymptomatic, then generally you just do observation and continue uh, conservative treatment and try and see if they get better in four to six weeks. You'll do routine imaging. If symptomatic, then usually you're going to do some kind of drainage procedure. And this is usually done with endoscopic ultrasound. And so they go in and they do the drainage from inside uh, the GI tract rather than doing it percutaneously, which can also be done. And then if still having like recurrent symptoms, then you do a necrosectomy, which is basically removing that whole ne necrotic walled off area. One thing to note in your pancreatitis patients is that, you know, after a few days, say you admit them on day one, and then day three or four, they're getting a little bit better, but then day six or day seven, they're starting to get worse then that's when you need to be suspicious that they're developing one of these complications, something like acute infected necrotic collection. Oh, and that's one other thing to note is that these two walled off necrosis and acute, ne acute necrotic collections can become infected. So if patient is worsening after five to seven days, then you need to get a repeat CT scan to look for some of these complications and possible infection. All right, and just really quickly, uh, just one last complication that you may be expected to know for pancreatitis. That's going to be hemorrhagic pancreatitis. This is going to happen in any of the kind of necrotizing pancreatitis. You may get some kind of hemorrhage that goes into the retroperitoneal space. And this is going to lead to two classic signs that are classic medical school pimping questions. And that's going to be the Cullen sign and the Gray-Turner sign, which is basically these ecchymosis. Uh, and if it's like kind of near the umbilicus, that's called Cullen sign. And Gray-Turner sign is going to be a bruise that's basically on the flanks. So here you see Cullen sign that's kind of around the umbilicus and then Gray Turner sign on the flanks. And so those are two classic signs you should be on the lookout for to uh, assess for hemorrhagic pancreatitis. All right. And so that's my basic approach to acute pancreatitis. Uh, covered a lot of the most common questions that you're really going to get about this subject. And I hope this was very useful for you. If you liked this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. If you have any questions, please leave them down in the comment section down below for me. Hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you in the next one. Thanks for watching and peace.